Good morning and welcome to the second session of the NIVO Lectures. I'm Michelle Clifton Soderstrom and I teach theology and ethics here and we are so delighted um, to have Dr. Brown Douglas for, um, for this morning. If you weren't here at the first lecture, she focused on the pathology of criminalizing black bodies and how that relates to um, stand your ground laws which protects um, and, and, and gives access to white bodies to free space while at the same time relegating black bodies to unfree space. And so she unpacked that in rich ways and we look forward to the second lecture where we, where we will hear about the justice of God. And if you haven't read her most recent book, Stand Your Ground, I highly encourage you to order that book and read it, especially if you'd like to go into more depth on some of these ideas. And with that, join me in welcoming back Dr. Brown Douglas. Thank you again. And let me say just once again what a privilege it is to be here and what a privilege you have as those of you who are students here and a part of this community to uh, be able to engage some of the professors that you have here because I certainly know their work, the uh, Clifton Soderstrom uh, work and others' work. And so thank you for all of you, the work that you do and for having me here. and. The work that you do supports making the world a better place, and so I thank you. I think this is, since we're in a seminary, maybe I'll get a little more theological. Uh, <laughs> and so try to uh, make that theological connection and talk about the justice of God. And so that we begin to understand that this isn't work that we just want to do, it's work that we must do because of who we claim to be as followers of Jesus. We need justice for our son, declared Michael Brown's parents after he was gunned down in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. Ironically, two days before Michael's death on August 7, 2014, a jury found the killer of Renisha McBride guilty of second-degree murder, along with other gun-related charges. You might recall that Renisha was the young black female in Michigan who, after knocking on a door for help following a single car accident, was shot in the face when the homeowner answered the door with shotgun in hand. On October 1, 2014, during a retrial, Michael Dunn was found guilty of Jordan Davis's murder. Jordan was the black male gunned down in Jacksonville, Florida gas station after a dispute over loud music. There had to be a retrial because Michael Dunn was initially found not guilty of that charge. Jordan's mother said this verdict represented justice, she said, for Trayvon and all the nameless faces and children of people that will never have a voice. The convictions of Renisha's and Jordan's killers, while certainly a just end in these cases, is not the full justice for which mothers or the other for which Michael's mother or the other mothers of murdered children demand. This is not the justice for which these black mothers weep. Theirs is a justice that goes beyond the convictions of their children's killers. The justice for which they wait and weep is divine justice, the very justice of God. And so it is in this second lecture, I want to ask what is the meaning of God's justice in this stand your ground time in which we find ourselves living? Now in answering this question, we must first understand something about the nature of stand your ground culture itself in relationship to God. That is, we must recognize that stand your, stand your ground culture is nothing less than a culture of sin, as I alluded to earlier. Sin. Sin is that which alienates humans from the very ways and will of God. It reflects a breach with God. It reflects a breach of what God stands for. Stand your ground culture reflects such a breach as it functions both on an individual and systemic level 
to alienate people from one another and from God. As Gustavo Gutierrez says, all injustice is a breach with God. As for its individual manifestation of sin, this is a culture that thrives on antagonistic relationships, as seen signaled by the very ideal of standing one's ground. In this regard, stand your ground culture does not value the sacred humanity and life of another. Indeed, as a sinful construct, stand your ground culture is sustained by a notion of not belonging. Certain human beings are assumed to not belong in spaces and to not belong to God. <laughs> Moreover, stand your ground culture disengages persons not only from their humanity, but most significantly from their very lives. Indeed, the person on the other side of the stand your ground gun is not seen as a human being, much less as a sacred child of God with a life that needs to be honored. One only needs to be reminded that Stand Your Ground Law was initially called Shoot First, suggesting that whoever was on the other side of the gun had no real worth. Behind the myth of self-protection, which Stand Your Ground Law hides behind, is a disdain for certain bodies, most notably the bodies of black and brown people. In effect, Stand Your Ground culture empowers people to deny the sacredness of God's human creation. It is therefore a culture of death. As a culture of death, it is antithetical to life, and therefore it is a negation of all that God stands for. Stand Your Ground culture stands in opposition to a God who creates life and who resurrected Jesus from the dead. Again, as much as individuals engage in the denigration and destruction of life in any way, and thus, in as much as they participate in Stand Your Ground culture, they have sinned. Stand Your Ground culture also nurtures systemic and structural sin. Laws, as I mentioned earlier, such as Stand Your Ground, Stop and Frisk, Conceal and Carry, speak for themselves. They objectify and value, devalue life. They are meant to oppress and humiliate. Other aspects of Stand Your Ground culture, such as the industrial prison complex, are structures and systems of sin as they thrive on denying life and freedom to others. There's no getting around it. Stand Your Ground culture in all of its manifestations is a culture of death. Theologian Sally McFaig is right when she says, quote, the dignity of human beings and the integrity of creation, first of all, rest, first of all, on our willingness to affirm the value of life, not just our own or our own tribe or religion or country or class or species, but all life. As she further suggests, we need to be able to look one another in the eye and see the good that is God. Stand your ground culture does not allow for people to see the goodness of God in the faces of those who are not white. Again, it is a culture of sin. It is, in fact, the sin that sin produced. If our discussion earlier revealed anything, it revealed that stand your ground, the Stand Your Ground culture, which took the lives of Trayvon, Jordan, Renisha, Jonathan, Rakia, James, Michael, Tamir, Freddie, and I could go on, is, a 20, is not just a 21st century phenomenon. Rather, it is part and parcel, as I said earlier, of America's narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, a narrative that designates free space as a white space, and thus meets black intrusion into that space with hostility, and more often than not, with the penalty of death. This narrative, the narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, therefore is nothing other than America's original sin. The doctrine of original sin is not meant to suggest the origins of sin itself. Rather, it signals the fact that the human condition is one defined by captivity to sin. To recognize America's narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism as, as the nation's original sin is to realize that the unspoken but palpable identity of the nation itself is a sinful identity. Essentially, 
the way in which the early Americans, that is the pilgrims and Puritans, as well as the founding fathers, because make no mistake about it, Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers were thoroughgoing and unabashed Anglo-Saxonists. Thomas Jefferson wanted Anglo-Saxon grammar taught in the university and said to his granddaughter that Tacitus' book, Germania, was one of the best books ever written. So make no mistake about it. The way in which these early Americans constructed the identity of this nation is consequential. It has virtually meant that from its earliest beginnings, the nation has been held captive to sin. There have been those who have considered the inhumane treatment of the Native Americans as America's original sin. Others have claimed it to be the enslavement of African Americans. Both are sins, but they are sins that sin produced. They are reflections of stand your ground culture, which itself is a production of America's grand narrative of exceptionalism. In his second inaugural address, Abraham Lincoln lamented that American slavery was an offense to, to God. It was, in his estimation, a sin. He conjectured, even though he had not so ambivalent feelings about the equality of black Americans, he never believed that, <laughs> but he conjectured that the Civil War, which had torn the nation apart, was a result of that sin. He feared, in his words, the judgment of the Lord if the sin of slavery were not removed. Lincoln was right in naming slavery as a sin. What he did not understand, however, was the original sin that produced slavery, the very exceptionalism upon which the nation is built. And so, as pointed out earlier, some 150 years later, our nation is still a nation divided by war. It is divided by a stand your ground culture war. It cannot be said enough that such a war will reinvent itself throughout history until the original sin of America's Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism is forthrightly addressed and eliminated. The salvation of our nation depends upon it. And this brings us to the justice of God. For the manifestation of salvation from the sin of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism signals nothing less than the reality of God's justice. As Daniel Day Williams said, God's justice is manifest in God working to put down the unrighteous idols to show mercy and achieve reconciliation in a new order which expresses human beings' dignity as the, those who bear the divine image. In other words, God's justice means a restoration of the sacred dignity of all people. God's justice means healing the breach of sin that is injustice. As Gustavo Gutierrez points out, again to repeat, all injustice is a breach of God. And so healing this breach means nothing less than freedom, yes, from sin, freedom from the injustice itself. And so first and foremost, God's justice means freedom. Freedom not in some other world, but in the world in which the sin of injustice functions. Put simply, if sin is not simply an otherworldly construct, but rather is that which impacts the quality and conditions of one's historical life, then the salvation which is God's justice must not simply refer to an otherworldly or spiritual state. It must not simply refer to some peace in the soul. The freedom from sin that is God's justice must be an earthly freedom. Moreover, the meaning of that freedom must be understood from the vantage point of the victims of injustice, the vantage point of the victims of stand your ground culture. Why? Because it matters that Jesus died on the cross just as it matters that God freed the Israelites from bondage. For through both of these divine revelations, God revealed a preferential option for freedom, a freedom that was defined by God's solidarity with the oppressed 
enslaved, the crucified classes of people in the world. Now let me stay with this just for a moment. That Jesus was crucified affirms his absolute identification with the Trayvons, the Jordans, the Renishas, and all the other victims of the Stand Your Ground culture war. Jesus' identification with the crucified class is not accidental. It is intentional. It did not begin with his death on the cross. In fact, that Jesus was crucified signals his prior bond with the crucified class of his day. There is perhaps no story that reveals this more than the story of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well. I like this story. For in the social religious context of Jesus' day, there was a long history of conflict between Jews and Samaritans. Jews had constructed images of Samaritans as an indecent and ritually impure people. Samaritan women were considered the most impure of all. Multiple narratives of power intersected on the bodies of Samaritan women, ethnic, gender, and cultural power. Put simply, they represented at once an inferior race, gender, and religion. Samaritan women were indeed the least of these in Jesus' day. Moreover, the relationship between Jewish men and Samaritan women was one of extreme opposition. This relationship reflects in the first century Roman world the antagonistic, the type of antagonistic relationship between white bodies and black bodies in a context of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Yet, as the story unfolds, Jesus initiates a salvific relationship with this woman. The body that is constructed as the most oppressed and opposed to the most rather opposed to his, and most significantly, the body that represents the most scorned and marginalized of his day, is one in which he makes an alliance. In making such an alliance, Jesus repudiates the narratives and constructs of power. He empties himself of the power and privileges that might come with being a Jewish male and effectively becomes one with the crucified class of people. His crucifixion is therefore inevitable. Theologians have referred to Jesus' self-emptying as kenosis, which indicates his sacrificial obedience to God. However, when understood in the context of Jesus' full ministry as it led to his crucifixion, this self-emptying indicates his letting go, letting go of anything that would compromise his absolute alliance with those of the crucified class, even unto the cross. John Soprino puts it this way, the cross for its part tells of God's affinity with victims. The point of the matter is that it is only when the least of these, in this instance those victims of stand your ground culture, are free to achieve the fullness of life that is theirs, only then will God's justice be realized. Their freedom will indicate an eradication of all that separates people one from another and disengages all people from the goodness of their humanity. It is only when the least of these are honored, respected, and, uh, and, and esteemed in the world, systemically, structurally, and individually, only then that we will know the justice that is God. It is only then, when they are free, that then we will know we are free from sin. It happened one night on an isolated road. As they were headed back to college, my son and two of his black male friends were stopped by white police officers. By all accounts, even that of my son's white lawyer, they were stopped for the crime of driving while black. From putting them up against the car, frisking them, and searching their car numerous times, the officers did all that they could to let my son and his friends know that being college students did not exempt them from being criminals. As if to ensure that they recognized this, my son and his friends were made to appear in court. At the end of the day, no crime was committed, so the case was eventually resolved. The incident reminded me, however, of how close my worst nightmare was to becoming reality. The wrong word spoken, the wrong move made, 
and my son could have become a stand-your-ground culture casualty. And without parents who were aware of the criminal justice system and who had the means to hire a lawyer, my son would have become another black male trapped in the stand-your-ground cycle of criminality. And so, as my son was free to leave the courtroom, I thought of all of those sons of black mothers that are not free to leave, but become trapped in the cycle of criminality simply because they are black or poor and poor. It is from their vantage point that we are to understand the justice of God. And so what does that look like? What does it mean to be free from the sin of stand your ground culture, from the vantage point of stand your ground cultures most victimized? Now, I'm gonna make a little, another little excursion before I get to that, and that is this. To say that there has been no faith tradition which has witnessed more to the meaning of God's justice and thus freedom than the black faith tradition. Informed by a rich African religious heritage, and forged in the crucible of slavery, black faith is grounded in two core beliefs. First, that God is by nature free therefore complete in God's self and dependent on no other being or power for existence. And second, that God's movement in history reflects God's utter freedom. Now, to proclaim God free by nature is, as many of you know, to attest to God's transcendence. The transcendence of God indicates that God is not bound by this world. A transcendent God is one who is free from being boxed in by every, any human projection. God is free from all finite, limiting, human constructed realities. The transcendence that is the freedom of God is what black church people testify to when they say God can be God all by God's self. Now, to affirm the freedom of God is essential for black faith born on the soil of their oppressor's land. A faith that claimed that God intended for black people to be slaves, as their oppressor's faith was, that, is rel that intended for black people to be relegated to an unfree space, it becomes insignificant that black faith affirms no, that God is free. For inasmuch as black faith affirms that, black people, like all people, are created in the image of this God, then it affirms that black people themselves are created and meant to be free. That is, like God, the God in whose image they are created, free, free from all human constructs and constraints that prevent the full flourishing of life. Simply put, because black faith affirms that humans are created in the image of a free God and not the other way around, it also affirms that black bodies are to be free from the ravages of stand your ground culture. Let me just point out one thing uh, quickly, that while Europeans and their enslavers may have introduced some of the Africans and many of the captured Africans to Christianity, to their version of Christianity. They didn't introduce them to God. The Africans knew God in freedom, and God knew them in freedom. They knew a God that was free, and God knew a people that was free. This became the kind of barrier of resistance to any belief that God intended them to be enslaved. And so they brought this experience of a free God and a God who knew them in freedom with them across the Middle Passage. And so they could continue to affirm that regardless of what their captors said, they knew that God did not create them at all to be slaves. Which leads to the second fundamental affirmation of black faith when it comes to the freedom of God. Black faith affirms that this is a freedom that, as I said earlier, is manifest in history. In short, black faith affirms, as many of you no doubt know, that just as God freed the Israelites from slavery, 
and Jesus from the crucifying death of the cross, God would likewise free black people from the enslaving and crucified reality of their living. Black faith, therefore, provides black women and men with the tools to resist the Anglo-Saxonist discursive productions that attempt to crush their very spirit and destroy their very lives. Indeed, the black faith tradition itself is nothing less than a discourse of resistance that allows black people to infirm their innate and created worth, even when all around them suggest their other worthlessness. This faith testifies to another way of seeing oneself that is not determined by the ideologies of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, such as white supremacy. Black faith testifies to a God that allows black people to maintain their sense of divine dignity and, and, to, de- and to claim their strength in the face of a stand-your-ground culture that seeks to pervert their self-images and disrespect their bodies. This faith enables black people to see themselves from beyond the veil of Anglo-Saxon whiteness. In the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, it frees black men and women from the sense of always looking at oneself, he said, through the eye of white others. This faith, therefore, helps black women and men to develop an independent consciousness and thus to claim their God-given and alienable right to be free, free from the web of sin produced by the sin of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. To reiterate, as I can't say enough, such freedom is nothing less than the justice of God, as again God's justice means freedom from sin. One of the clearest witnesses to the meaning of freedom when it comes to the justice of God and its significance for black people was on display this summer at the time of the massacre of nine black church people in Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston. To the surprise, if not consternation of some, various family members of those parishioners slain by Dylan Roof proclaimed that they forgave him. While the meaning of forgiveness is complex within the black faith tradition, such forgiveness is not about the exoneration of a killer for the deadly injustice he allegedly perpetrated. Rather, it's not about him at all. It is about the justice of God and the freedom of those families from the killer's sinful act, an act, by the way, fueled by the ideology of white supremacy, which is a sin which Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism produced. The forgiveness demonstrated by the families of the slain in the first instance recognizes that no human justice can adequately respond to the grave injustice of such a racist, terroristic, murderous crime. Forgiveness, then, is a sign of the family's faith that God's justice will ultimately prevail, and thus their forgiveness is freeing, for it frees them from the anguish of knowing that no human justice will make up for the the loss of their family members. Secondly, forgiveness frees the family from being trapped in the sinful cycle of the killer's hate. Forgiveness is not a palliative for rightful anger and rage. Instead, it frees the family from the sin of hate that not only distorts their own sense of self, but also prevents them from moving forward in their own living. But more importantly, forgiveness recognizes that the loving justice of God is more powerful than the sin of white racist hate. In the end, forgiveness within black faith, within the black faith tradition, inasmuch as it is grounded in a belief in the justice of God, frees black people to continue to persevere in the struggle to be free from the sinful productions of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. And so, with this, let us return to the question of what precisely the justice of God that is freedom looks like, systemically, structurally, and individually in these stand-your-ground times. What are the implications for us? In response to the 1960s racial unrest, James Baldwin declared, the time has come, he said, for us to examine ourselves. 
but we can only do this if we are willing to free ourselves from the myths of America and to find out what is really happening here. To be sure, he continued, to, to be sure, we continue to be trapped in the sin of stand your ground culture. Why? Because of America's inability to free itself from the myth of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. So how do we do that? Such freedom begins with what I call a moral memory. Moral memory, first and foremost, is about white America owning the truth of who they are. James Baldwin puts it this way. Go back to where you started, as far back as you can. Examine all of it. Get, travel your road and tell the truth about it. Baldwin, in effect, calls white Americans to tell the truth about, as he puts it, the price of the ticket for being white in America. To do so is at least the beginning of white America taking responsibility for the past and thus responsibility for the persistence of stand your ground culture. In this regard, moral memory is not about exonerating oneself from the past. Again, it is about taking responsibility for it. To have a moral memory is to recognize the past we carry within us, the past we actually want to carry within us, and the past we need to make right. And writing the past is about more than facile apologies or even guilty verdicts for the killings of innocent black children. Rather, a moral memory recalls the story of America's chosen identity, the way it was shaped by the Anglo-Saxon myth, and thus recognizes how that continues to play itself out in our current reality. A moral memory does not ignore, but recognizes the racial contract that is America's democracy and the way that racial contract continues to be enacted. A moral memory uncovers the relationship between the slaveocracy and the industrial prison complex. It reveals the laws of stand your ground culture as a reincarnation of black codes. A moral memory allows one to see what happened to Renisha, Jonathan, Jordan, and Trayvon as legalized 21st century lynchings. As President Obama said in a speech that addressed the racial history of America, invoking the words of William Faulkner, the past is never dead. It is not even past. A moral memory allows one to recognize how, in fact, the past is not past, but continues to shape our present realities. Undoubtedly, it is only with the help of a moral memory that the connection between America's very sense of itself and a stand your ground culture will come to light. Until that occurs, stand your ground culture will be an ever present part of American reality, just as much as it is a part of America's identity. And so it is that Baldwin wishes that Americans, white Americans, would read for their own sakes this record and stop defending themselves against it. Only then, he says, will they be enabled to change their lives. The fact that they have not been able to do this, to face their history, to change their lives, that is, white people, hideously menaces this country. Indeed, he says, it menaces the entire world. <laughs> to be sure, the injustice of God, which is freedom from the sin of stand your ground culture, demands that America, especially white America, embraces a moral memory, which leads to a second requirement, if you will, of the justice of God, and that is a moral identity. A moral identity recognizes, as Paul Tillich says, quote, that every human soul has infinite value. A moral identity is what Tillich calls the courage to be oneself. To be oneself is to be the child of God that one is, nothing more and nothing less. A moral identity, therefore, is free from any constructs and ideologies that distort the integrity of another's sacred being. 
A moral identity is one that is relieved of pretensions to superiority, yet lets go of myths that suggest one people is more valuable than another, or that one people is chosen by God while another is not. A moral identity affirms the shared humanity of all human beings. Essentially, it is with a moral identity that one lives into the image of a God who is free, for it frees one from moving through the world as if entitled because of their blood or their color to certain wages, entitled to certain wages such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At the same time, it frees one to move through the world with empathy, thus feeling, as I said earlier, the suffering, the heartache, the hunger of others for life, liberty, and happiness. In many respects, a moral identity is the human response to Jesus' kenosis. That is, the way in which he emptied himself of anything that would set himself apart from humanity, especially crucified humanity. It is only with a moral identity that one is able to enter into solidarity with the crucified class of one's own time and thus to be where Jesus is. It is only with a moral identity that one is free to recognize the face of Jesus and thus the very revelation of God in the victim of stag your ground culture. The Matthean question might be, and so where did you see me? I saw you on a street in Stanford, Florida. I saw you on a porch in Detroit, Michigan. I saw you on the street corner in New York. I saw you in the back of a paddy wagon in Baltimore. I saw you on the Texas highway. I saw you in a park in Cleveland. We are all called to a moral identity, which is nothing less, nothing less than an identity with the crucified God. The justice of God also requires moral participation. Such participation is a matter of faith. We should be reminded that the Greek word for faith is used in the Gospels is pistis. This word does not suggest a way of thinking about who God is or reflecting upon God's relationship to us. But rather, it points to a way of acting in light of our relationship to God. Put simply, faith is not about loyalty to a certain doctrine, dogma, or set of beliefs. Instead, it involves a commitment to a certain way of living and moving and having our being in the world. As Gustavo Gutierrez says, faith is the total human response to God. Faith recognizes that God acts first, thus inviting human beings into a relationship. It is important to recognize that this relationship comes in the form of God acting in the world to make real the freedom of God, which is justice. Thus, God's call to faith is an invitation to become a partner with God in creating a world where justice is cherished and where freedom flourishes. In these stand your ground times, creating such a world means first and foremost being free again from the violence of stand your ground culture. While the violence that sometimes disrupted protests, such as those in Ferguson and Baltimore, is readily named by dominant American culture, rarely named, if at all, is the violence that threatens the lives of black women, men, and children every single day in America. The violence bred by the narrative of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. The caricatures ingrained within the American imagination of the threatening black male and angry black female about which I spoke earlier, which lead to black people being twice as likely to be arrested, being four times as likely to experience force during an encounter with police, those caricatures are violent. <laughs> the criminal justice disparities that cause one in 15 black men to be incarcerated and make it four times more likely for black women in comparison to white women to be incarcerated, th those criminal justice disparities are violent. 
a juvenile justice system in which black youth are disproportionately sentenced to adult prisons is defiant. The socioeconomic policies rendering black children four times more likely than white or Asian children and significantly more likely than Latino children to live in poverty are violent. An educational system where black students are expelled at three times the rate of white students and where a quarter of high schools with the highest percentage of black and Latino students do not offer any Algebra two classes, while a third of those schools do not have any chem chemistry classes. That system is violent. This is the unnamed violence that is woven into the fabric of America. It is the violence generated by the sin of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. It is the violence of stand your ground culture. And so, to strive for the justice of God requires the kind of moral participation that frees black and brown bodies from the complex systemic and structural violence of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism that devalues every single day black people's humanity. Justice, therefore, represents the peace of God. Again, this is a peace, this peace is a freedom from all that distorts the human person. No peace, no justice. And finally, the justice of God requires a moral imagination. A moral imagination is grounded in the absolute belief that the world can be better. It disrupts the notion that the world as it is, is how God intended it to be and how God's gonna leave it. With a moral imagination, one is able to live holistically, that is, as if the new heaven and the new earth were already here. In the words often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Or as Audre Lorde, uh, black feminist and uh, lesbian poet and social activist Audre Lorde once put it, we must crave the world we want for our children. This means that we are not to be constrained by what is. Instead, with moral imagination, we are free to be oriented toward what will be. A moral imagination thus defies the power of stand your ground culture. It recognizes this culture as a human construct that does not in any way reflect God or God's justice. For the black faithful, it is from a moral imagination that hope comes. For such hope trusts in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. that the arc of God's universe does in fact bend toward justice. It was unquestionably a moral imagination that enabled King to proclaim that with or without him, black people would get to the promised land. And it was because of this moral imagination that he could close his I Have a Dream speech with the confidence that one day black people would be, as he said, free at last. And so what does the justice of God in these stand your ground times look like, even as it requires of us moral memory, moral identity, moral participation, and a moral imagination? The justice of God looks like an end to the very culture which has virtually declared a war on innocent young black bodies. As shaken as I was, and I was, by the senseless deaths of Trayvon, Jordan, Renisha, Jonathan, and then Michael, John, and Tamir, and I could go on and on, I have been even more moved by a mother's faith. These are mothers who refuse to be consoled until they get justice for their children. As I said in her letter to Michael Brown, in, in her letter to Michael Brown's parents, Trayvon Martin's mother, Sabrina Fulton, said this. She said, we will bond as parents of slain children. We will continue to fight for justice and make them remember our children in an appropriate light. We must all bond with these black mothers. We must absolutely refuse to be consoled until this world is safe for our black children and God's justice is done 
and thus stand your ground culture has not simply transformed itself, but has been defeated. We must refuse to live in to the slogan in the culture that says, make America great again. That greatness is defined by the reality of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, and we all know it. Fifty years ago, when King stood at the Lincoln Memorial, he said, now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Now is the time in this country. It is the time to live into God's time and to create the world that we indeed crave for our sons and daughters. That new earth where the time of stand your ground culture, no matter how it transforms itself, is absolutely no more. If we believe in the God of Jesus Christ, then now is the time for the justice of God to be made real. Let's stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So we have time for Q&A again, and as with the first session, um, make sure you introduce yourself and say who you are as you address um, Dr. Brian Douglas with the question. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. Thank you. My name is Jen Gillen, and I'm a pastor. I graduated from here in 2011. My question is, how, in this Kairos moment, as you described, how would you encourage those of us who have hybrid identities, perhaps those of us who, um, whose parents are immigrants, um, who swim in waters of the dominant culture and in waters of our culture? Um, uh, well, I'm sorry, I didn't who hear the Who first. swim in waters of the dominant culture? Oh, yes. And then swim in waters um, of our parents' culture. How do we find our, what is our place in our particular role in this um, pursuit of freedom uh, and justice um, in this Kairos moment? Well, the, uh, the qu quick response, and then I'll develop it, it's, it's not a cavalier response, is to find your way swimming only in waters that are not those of the dominant culture. We all have privileges we can claim in one way or the other. What we must learn to do is to stand over and against those privileges and to empty ourselves of those privileges. So to connect with those on the least of these that aren't privileged, that's what Jesus did. That's what the kenosis is all about. And so in terms, so we have to do that, which means when we are, we do represent realities of the dominant culture. First of all, I keep, I keep saying, and I really mean this, just because you represent those realities by who you are biologically or whatever, just because you happen to look like a white American, you really don't have to act like one. Because the point of the matter is we're talking about living over and against, not who you are, but living over and against white culture, right? And naming that culture, naming the ways in which you have lived into it, consciously, wittingly, and unwittingly. I like this thing. Many of you might know Susan Brooks Thistlewaite, who uh, taught over at uh, CTS. Susan said in one of her earlier books, she said that the most, and this is a pretty good thing, she said that the most white Americans can ever become are recovering racists. Like that. And of course, borrowing from the 12 step uh, programs, she says, because when you're recovering races, the first thing you have to do is what? Name the disease. Name that you're a racist. Recognize the disease. 
and recognize and every anyone that's white in America is racism is not a part of our individual DNA, but it is a part of our culture DNA. It is a part of our nation's DNA. And so what is it seeps in, we're all infected by what is a virus really of racism. So you have to name the disease. And once you name it, then you have to recognize that you must be proactive in fighting it. So that every single solitary day, you have to say, I'm not going to live into that today. I'm not going to live into my white privilege today. And, those, and that privilege acts itself out in a variety of ways. Even if it's the, you, so, sort of acts itself out by you notice that you sort of clutched your pearls if you wear them or walked a didn't notice that your door was unlocked until you saw uh, some black or brown males walking across the street. Now, the thing about this, when you're recovering, sometimes you do what? You slip. That's okay. Just get back on the wagon. And so I like this notion, right? Because it means that white people then become to take begin to take responsibility for their own recovery but that can only happen after they recognize the disease that they have. And so we all have to do that. Now, what about, and I know, you know, people always say, well, black people can be racist too. Well, no, not really. <laughs> but because racism, if we understand it properly, is something that has to do with power. You have to be able to enact, have the power to enact uh, uh, your privilege, your dominance. But in this recovery model, we can become enablers to that. And so we have to as well name the ways in which we've been impacted by the disease of racism. It's in the family because it's in the nation's DNA. And what are the ways in which we have been impacted by that? Uh, to, and how are we enablers of that? Even perhaps in the ways in which we see ourselves and the ways in which we see one another. Uh, in the ways in which instead of trying to dismantle systems and structures of unjust privilege and undue penalty, the ways in which we try to gain privilege within unjust systems in the first place. Because it's not a matter of gaining white privilege, it's a matter of eliminating a system that grants it in the first place. Uh, uh, and so those, those, so I think, you know, that's what we all have to do, re regardless of what kind of sort of heritage and uh, what's in our bodies and in our blood, we had to name it. And then, you know, this thing that James Baldwin says about the price of the ticket for being white. But he, and he means just that. If we walk around comfortably in our privilege, we need to name the price of the ticket for doing that. What did we give up? What are we giving up? What are we doing for others, doing to others, so that we can walk around comfortably in our whiteness? And sometimes we can be white without looking white because we don't recognize the ways in which we have been impacted by the disease of white racism. And so when we run around being white without looking white, we're enabling, we're enabling the very system of white supremacy and white racism. Does that get at what you ask? And if not, ask again. And I'm serious. question, and that is, um, some, sometimes with my students, my white students, they talk about um, giving up their power. And so my question is, and my response is, well, yes, that's a good thing, to, that's a good right step in, the, in a good direction, but, but you don't get to opt out of whiteness, and with whiteness carries power, too. And so would that's you right. distinguish between power and privilege, and if not, help us think yeah, and then when, when it's give up your power, it, why don't we claim the power to dismantle the privilege? And and that's what I, what people have to rec, what white people have to recognize is the power they do have. And it's not a matter of giving up power, it's a matter of how you use that power, right? And so indeed they need to be empowered to use their power to change and to eliminate the privilege they have. And the, they have the privilege to use, to choose the way in which they want to use that power, right? Does that, uh, and so, and I think that that's what, that's the, that's what has to be said. No, it's not about 
power, it's about how you use the power. And so claim your power, but claim it differently, right? Because we know that, you know, one of the privileges in this country is white power. But let's take the white off of it, right? And so let's not, let's not define it by whiteness. Let's sort of define it by, really define it by our common humanity and what that means and what that looks like. And to claim that power. Hi, Good Jess. Good to see you. So, uh, as I'm hearing this, I'm thinking about, like, how do I go back to my context? What, what, what can I say to a group of majority white Caucasian Christian leaders in the church? And I just wonder what, what if anything, you would have to say about the, the role of preaching radical nonviolence? Because it seems to me, when I'm hearing all of this, the, the standard around culture comes from a place of fear. Like, what? Why do I need a gun to protect myself? So I'm afraid. And, it, and I just wonder if, if, if anything can be said about preaching radical nonviolence. Because it seems like, you know, when Jesus is being taken away by the Roman soldiers, he doesn't fight back. He tells his... And I, I don't want to turn this into, well, you know, we should just all turn the other cheek, but... What role does that play? Oh, because he wasn't really turning the other cheek in the way no. in which we think about that. <laughs> yeah, what, let's, 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 thank you for that question. Uh, uh, good question. Um, something you said, well, uh, and maybe it'll come to me. Um, nonviolence and radical nonviolence. First, before we can even talk about nonviolence, we have to rightly name violence. Because nonviolence is the opposite, if you will, response to violence. It is interesting that we rarely talk about violence unless it's the violence of those people who are protesting the violence of their lives. And we rarely call for nonviolence unless we're calling for nonviolent protests. So, first thing we have to do, for I, I don't even want to talk about nonviolence until we have a discussion of violence and what violence is and the violence of these systems and structures of oppression and the violence of the people that oppress. And then, now then we can talk a little bit about nonviolence. And so, how do we now break the cycle, you see, of violence. That's what we're talking about, breaking the cycle of violence. So how do we break that? What does radical nonviolence look like? Radical nonviolence does indeed look like what Jesus did on the cross. It looks like not in any way, in any way, compromising with, giving authority to, complying with the systems and structures that would crucify other bodies. That's what Jesus did when he remained silent. They whipped him up the hill, up the hill, up the hill, the spiritual says, and he didn't say a mumbling word. He did not in any way give authority to those ecclesiastical and political systems and structures. Didn't even recognize that they had authority. Nonviolence. Radical nonviolence means not recognizing the authority of violent systems and structures in any way. That's radical nonviolence, right? Radical nonviolence is Jesus going to the cross, not saying a mumbling word, even unto, as this song says, even unto death. Because it means radical solidarity with the crucified classes of people. Radical nonviolence means shouting, stop the crucifixions. That's radical nonviolence. Right? And so, Martin Luther King Jr., while he didn't augur, obviously, for uh, the kind of violence that we see spilling out on the streets, but he did say, that violence, that riots, he said, quote-unquote, what they call riots, and I don't uh, talk about that in a minute, 
what uh, riot in terms of the Baltimore protests. But he said riots are the voice of the voiceless. They cry. You don't listen. Got to get you to listen. You got to keep raising a voice. If you don't, if you don't listen with your hearts and see what what these cultures of death are doing to you, then we got to keep hollering out till you listen. And so, instead of focusing, well, I don't want people spilling out in the streets in that way because they get killed. And so, and, and it further harms their communities as if those communities aren't harmed enough. But, instead of looking at that kind of response is by and talking about that violence, radical nonviolence, if you want to say stop the violence, then we have to indeed, we have to indeed produce and foster a program of radical nonviolence. That means right in the middle of those spaces of protest, start talking about the things that made those people protest. That's radical nonviolence. We see the radical nonviolence of Jesus as, as, throughout his ministry. But make no mistake about it, his radical nonviolence did not mean uh, passive, aggressive, passive behavior that wasn't aggressive or forceful. No, it wasn't praying that got him on the cross. And, <laughs> and it wasn't. We, we have to understand the violence that was the violence of the cross, which was the violence of this world, and we always, like, we don't talk about, I know many of you are reading James Cone's Cross and the Lynching Tree. He's right. You know, the cross is, was nothing but first century lynching. A spectacle lynching at that. All those folks looking around, you know, you know how spectacle lynchings go. Uh, duh, and so, that's radical nonviolence. And it begins in recognizing what violence is. Uh, yes, and I think if we do that, and I really do believe that if we do that, then we can stop some of the violence that which you were referring to, these sort of physical acts of violence that end up on the streets, and stop that if we are really radically nonviolent before it even gets there to break the cycle of violence. King said that someone had to break the cycle of violence, <laughs> and that's why he... Uh, carried forth a nonviolent movement. And it was radically nonviolent because he didn't just sort of pray and for the world to change. He went out and he carried the cross. As he put it, he bared the cross. And he looked violence in the eye and named it and tried to stop it. One, one more thing. I just can't. I was going to say something about riots and the use of the words riot to describe what happened <laughs> in Baltimore and the way people quickly talk about the riots. And of course, the anniversary of that's coming up, so we're going to hear a lot about the riots again. First of all, it wasn't right. <laughs> but, and, you know, CNN kept looping the same. CVS being burned to the ground. You would have thought there were 50 CVSs in that neighborhood. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we're sitting there in Baltimore, and the, I, well, I'm, I'm at Goucher, and at that point, all of our students, many of our students sort of simultaneously gathered in the student union, and our students were very engaged, as many of us, in uh, what was going on in Baltimore. And so many of the students gathered, as well as faculty, just spontaneously, and the president of the college and others, and we were in and with CNN on and ended up engaging in conversation about what was going on. We were there until like 2 in the morning, but kept seeing the same car loop, uh, the, uh, the same CVS loop as being burned down, and they kept saying, CVS is just burning down. This is one CVS. Uh, and they also kept showing the same police car getting uh, turned over and all of that. And kept saying, that's the same car, <laughs> same corner. Uh, uh, and of course, for people not there, it looks like, oh my gosh, Baltimore's going up in flames. No, not really. But the other thing, by characterizing that protest or uprising or whatever one wants to call it as a riot, what you do in using the riot, the language, excuse me, the la 
language of riot, is that you don't give legitimation to black protest. You, what you in effect say is that black people don't have any legitimate forms of protest. They cannot legitimately protest. And that's again what happened in, in Ferguson. You de delegitimize black protest of any kind. So you don't have to take it seriously. The moment you use the language of riot, you don't have to take seriously what's going on. Again, what you do is then you flip who the victim is, right? And so then you began to talk about, you, you make the victims into uh, the perpetrators of a crime. And so you delegitimize their protests. And so it's, it's always amazing to me how quickly the language of riot begins to be enacted. Because the moment that enters the American imagination and consciousness, there's nothing valid or legitimate about what's going on. Understand the narrative so that we deconstruct what we believe is dominant. Uh, we use dominant culture. We use words that Jesus doesn't use and God does not use. And so, how do we as Christians equalize our human relationship from the constructs that create this illusion that there is a dominant culture? And how do we get those who believe they are dominant? to stop using that language so that they can recognize their common humanity. Yeah, well, yes, that's, now that's a whole biblical uh, studies class. Thank you. And it functions on so many levels and in so many of these issues, race, sexuality, uh, et cetera. Let me sort of make some general statements about that and see if it, uh, first of all, we always, which I'm sure all of you know, we have to continue to affirm th that um, while God's story may be somewhere in there in the Bible, the Bible is not God's story and God's story is not the Bible. There are many stories contained in that book. And they have to be teased out. <laughs> because here is the thing. The Bible claims to be a witness to the revelation of God. You say, no, people giving witness to the revelation of God. And here's the funny thing about the revelation. It's kind of a catch-22. Because here's the thing. Revelation, God's self-disclosure, right? Now, if revelation is going to be revelation, you know, people always say, God, nothing's impossible with God. God can do whatever God wants to do, and God can. Here's the thing. If revelation is going to be revelation, then God has to reveal God's self in a way that human beings can get it. Or it's not revelation. Right? Now, we can't do anything. We can't escape our finite realities in our history. So that means God's got to come into our history and reveal God's self to us here, because otherwise it's not going to be revelation because we aren't going to get it. So that means there are two components to this revelation thing. God's revealing and humans perceiving. Now, herein lies the problem. <laughs> Human beings are not objective knowers of anything. There's no objectivity in human reality. There's not. You know, people talk about justice is blind. It's only blind on the Supreme Court on that statue. Because the moment human beings have to apply it, it's no longer blind. So the moment that human beings get the revelation of God, it is not the way in which God reveals it. Because who we are shapes how we see the revelation. And this is just the first little contact in the Bible. So first, we know we have to sort of understand the people who claim to be receiving the revelation to try to tease that out so we can somewhere get to the revelation of God. Well, we always have to understand that we're never going to get it 
get to it the way God revealed it. So there are many stories there. That's just one little layer of the story. And then the story, you know, of all of the various levels that people bring their subjectivity to it. And there is, and I know you didn't mean it in this way, and we've got to recognize the dominant cultural stories that are being projected in that narrative. And the dominant cultural stories through which the revelation is being perceived. And so we have to always recognize the voices that are silent in there. We have to always try to go through in the stories that we have, go through the door of the ones that are sort of, wonder what they're thinking sitting over there. What they're, what, the, what they're singing over there in the story. So we got to do that because we have to recognize that the story is being told, the fact that they're able to tell it from a dominant cultural kind of perspective and lens. That's one thing. The other thing, of course, we have to recognize that we bring our story when we engage the text. And here's the thing we know, that many of the things, people run around and say many things that are in the Bible, you know, and they quote the Bible, and they haven't even read it. Because, really, you know, people run out, take the issue of sexuality. You know, they talk about what's in there. Well, no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, it's not there. What we have to recognize is that what many of us give authority to is not the text itself, but authority to a tradition of interpretation. And that's where we grant authority. And so somehow we have to begin to deconstruct and break, deconstruct and demythologize that tradition of interpretation and the authority it has. So when we do that, or when we have this tradition, authoritarian tradition of interpretation, when we go to text, we take that with us. We aren't reading, as you know, out of the text. We're reading into it. We're reading through a lens of interpretation. Whether it came from our grand, wherever it came from, from our faith communities. Because, you know, the preacher gets in the pulpit and he tells us what the Bible says and we believe it. We hear what the Bible says in our little Sunday school classes and wherever, wherever, and we believe it. So we develop a tradition of interpretation and it has authority for us. So, so that we have to recognize and claim. Uh, the, then the other thing that we have to do is this. And I'm falling short of, you know, real serious Bible study that has to take place so that people, even in our churches, people want to know what's in the Bible. So let's start with real people. We, get, we study and train in seminary, and then we go out and we say, oh, our people can't handle that. What? No, you can't handle that. Because it might mean if you really handle what's in the Bible, you might have to give up something. Right? So, so we got to do that. But here's the other thing that we have to recognize. That there are also many stories in the Bible. As Phyllis Tribble says, who spoke, who's spoken here before, one of these lectures, as Phyllis Tribble says, there are texts of terror. There are. And so what we have to say, first of all, is that some texts have to lose authority for us. But the other thing that we have to ask ourselves is this. What tradition do we want to live into? A tradition that terrorizes or a tradition that frees and liberates? How we make that decision is based on who we think God is. Do we think God is someone who terrorizes or frees and liberates? The love of God is about life and liberation. So we have to make that decision. And if we think, if we make the decision, if we believe in a God that loves through freedom and through life, then we have to never, ever 
give authority to any interpretation of the text or any text that terrorizes in any way. And any time we do that, we have lived over and against who we claim God to be. And so, does that get it? A little bit, a little bit. Professor Douglas, on behalf of North Park Theological Seminary, we're grateful that you are here. You have blessed us, even as you have that. challenged us, and for that, we're grateful. Thank you, and I am grateful. Anybody who is on the list uh, for the lunch today, the lunch will be in N20. So. <laughs> <laughs>